Good morning. It is really good to have you all here. We have some folks that will keep filtering in, but we'll go ahead and uh, get started. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, for those of you on uh, Facebook and Zoom, we usually have two uh, slides that we share with you, uh, especially on Facebook, whatever follows our service, we didn't direct it or endorse it. And uh, also, if you lose feed, if, you, uh, if you're watching the service on Zoom or Facebook and you lose the feed on it, we have the whole service. Go to the website, hit video services in the header, and you can watch uh, whatever you want in the service. As far as calendar goes, uh, right after this service, a catered lunch for children and youth volunteers, that's for people that are already volunteering or for someone who might be interested, um, just going to kind of lay out what we do. We have extra food, so you're welcome to stay. Just give us a few minutes and we'll talk about what we're doing in those ministries. Tonight, the uh, youth have a video game night. Uh, tomorrow, uh, the uh, chess club meets uh, for a lunch at noon here. We'll give you food and then Tim Samolitis will take us through uh, various ways that you can play chess better. He has a long way to go with me, but he's not giving up. Um, Tuesday, there's necessity closet at 10, exercise at 5, uh, divorce care at 6. Uh, Wednesday, uh, we have our dinner, wonderful dinner at 5. Uh, let us know if you're coming to that. Bible study is at 6, as is Awana. Awana this week will be a trunk or treat where uh, different tables will have a certain theme and kids will come through. I think they need one or two extra tables that's decorated, and then you kind of you dress in costume along with the decoration. That's at 6 o'clock Wednesday night. Men's group this uh, Wednesday night, 715. Uh, Better Together group on Thursday, as is exercise class. Um, I think that um, there's a holiday, <clears throat> holiday support series, Surviving the Holidays Grief Shares, November 13th, uh, Surviving the Holidays Divorce Care, November 23rd. Um, we will uh, continue to promote that, but it may be an opportunity for someone to go to a one-time event around grief or around divorce, and it may encourage them to get involved in the, in the group over time. Still a group going to Charlotte for the Operation Christmas Child uh, Warehouse. I have a couple of days there. We'll, we'll, we'll pack shoeboxes. Brian, uh, Brian Brown's bringing that together. Uh, next week is a baptism. Uh, we have four or five people interested. If you've thought about baptism, Actually, I have a worksheet on the front pew. If you want to take that worksheet and look it over or give it to someone, we will uh, uh, we'll talk with them about it. And then the safety team meets Wednesday, November 3rd at 7.30. Thank you for being here. Let's prepare our hearts, says David Place.
As we're uh, looking at uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in uh, Matthew 5 to 7, uh, today Jesus talks about marriage and divorce. Uh, and so I thought about uh, when I got married and a song that was sung at um, the wedding when uh, Mona and I got married in 1982 was a song called To Trusting Jesus. Uh, the problem was is that there was no music to this ancient song, and so I threw... <laughs> Uh, an idea toward Ron, and Ron was able to piece together the words and the uh, chords. So we're going to share, share this. Uh, this was supposed to be a surprise, and then uh, Mona works in Awana, and uh, so I, we're practicing it Wednesday, and she comes to the door and has this look on her face. I'm supposed to be a surprise, dear. So, uh, <laughs> so Mona, surprise. Yeah. Anyway, this, uh, when Mona and I said I do, this was a song that uh, was sung right before we said our vows. To trust in Jesus, there begins the story. To separate pathways leading. Glory with God's Son, one and one, two eternal lives begun to trust in Jesus, are two within His care to. In Jesus, kneeling now together, two separate prayers, there now one prayer together in God's Son to our one. Let the Master's will. in Jesus, there begins a story, two separate pathways leading to glory with God's Son, one Would you stand and do the responsive reading with me, please? Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we, we know, know in part, part and, we and we prophesy, prophesy in part. part. But when completeness, completeness comes, comes 
what, what is, is in part, part disappears. disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, and I reasoned like a child. When I became, when I became a, a man, man, I put, I put the ways of childhood, childhood behind, behind me. me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see him face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three, three things remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Remain standing and we'll sing hymn number 66, To God Be the Glory. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life an atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of love. the sun, but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people Through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he had done. Will you bow in prayer with me, please? Gracious Heavenly Father, we come this morning to worship you with our minds, our hearts, and souls. Help us to center our thoughts on giving you thanks and praise for all of the blessings that you give us. Help us to hear the message this morning and to take it with us as we go into this week. May the music we hear lift us up as we open ourselves to you in this time of worship. May we remember to honor you in all we do and say to others. Now hear us as we pray the prayer you've given us. 
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Amen. Now you turn around and wave or say hi to each other. Hello. Are there any other children that want to come down? All ages are welcome. I have a couple pictures to show you. Um, I was going to show you a person, but she's shy and didn't want to come out here. Um, so this is a picture. Some, some of you who know my family might recognize very young versions of my mom and dad. Um, that's from the early 1950s. So... Um, that's, that's right around when they, I think that's actually their, the closest they have to a wedding picture. Um, and um, they're still living. Uh, they've been married more than 65 years, and they just really love each other. And uh, my dad is just an, a, an amazing husband. And uh, every day, I don't, I guess you guys probably know this, but this is my wife and me, you may recognize you may recognize my wife, Miss Sarah. And um, one of the things I do uh, as part of living with Sarah and, and loving Sarah is I try to think, um, what would my dad do in this situation? Because my dad has never, uh, in all the years that I grew up watching them, I never questioned for one second that my dad loved my mom. And um, he loved all of us. And he protected us and made us feel loved and safe. And I try to be that way for Sarah and for Lauren. Um, but you know what? My dad, he's kind of a grump. And uh, he, uh, once in a while, he would lose his temper. And uh, I can remember many times at dinner, uh, this was, you know, it was a different time back then. Uh, when one of us was getting a little out of hand, my dad had this fingernail that was just like made of steel. And uh, he would reach over and he would flick us on the head and it would make your ears ring. It would be so hard. And uh, so hopefully, hopefully your dad doesn't do that. But even then, I didn't, I didn't question that my dad loved me. He just wanted me to shut up <laughs> um, <laughs> or not spill my drink. Um, we never made it through a meal without somebody spilling their drink. But my point is, my dad's not perfect. And he didn't love mom, and, mom perfectly and he still doesn't. So if I really want a good example of how to love Sarah, and if you want a really good example uh, of how to love the people around you, you should look to your mom and your dad, but ultimately you should look to, to Jesus because he loves us perfectly. He loves us even when we won't shut up, and he loves us even when we aren't good, and uh, he loves us perfectly. Um, and it doesn't matter uh, whether we deserve it or not because he still loves us. And that's an important thing to remember. So your mom and dad hopefully love each other, but um, Jesus definitely does. We don't ever have to say hopefully. Isn't that a good thing to think about? Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, that you love us perfectly. That um, even when we're bad, even when we don't do the things that we should do, even when we don't care the way that we should, and even when we don't love you, the way we should, you still love us perfectly. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, guys. If there's any uh, children that need to get up and head out for Children's Church, uh, leave now. There's people waiting on you. Um, every service, uh, all the way through, I think, February, uh, Judy uh, Prater has 
uh, scheduled a ministry that uh, is a part of our church. It's a way for people to um, just connect maybe to an area, maybe to an area of service. So today is adult ministry, and uh, Judy's going to come and share her heart about that area. Hello. <laughs> adult ministry encompasses so many things, from times of pure fellowship, like that hotly contested chili cook-off that we had, to experiences of deep soul searching, like our much needed grief share and divorce care support groups. I could list the many studies we have done or the different adult Sunday school classes. I could list the life groups, the interest groups, the men's groups, the women's groups, but all of them would mean very little to me if it were not for the deep and meaningful relationships that have been built over time. For many years, I was consumed with working and raising a family, but I finally got involved in women's ministries after I retired at age 60. I had no idea how much it would mean to me to be a part of a support system of women friends to share my life with until I joined a women's circle at EBC and the women's Bible study. How I wish that I had not waited so long to nurture and be nurtured by these irreplaceable friendships. Take, for example, our women's Bible study. I was going through a tough time several years ago when I began to attend there. The women made me feel welcomed and accepted. I quickly made new friends and deepened old friendships. Every Bible study seemed to be written exactly for my needs. We prayed for one another, ate together, laughed, and even cried sometimes together. I have no doubt that God was doing his restorative work to meet my needs through this group of women. That was 12 years ago. And now, when I attend our women's Bible study, I deeply feel the presence of the Holy Spirit as one by one, someone will share the needs of their heart or their gratitude for an answered prayer, or we may share the burden of unanswered prayer. So many times I have left the group with an indescribable feeling of awe and gratitude for the women around the table with me. Sometimes the lessons we have studied have prompted deep discussions and sharing. Each person brings her own gifts of the Spirit, and always with God as our center, our lives are richer and fuller for the time we spend together. And so, there's room for others in our group. Or maybe you would like to start an additional group of your own. Let us know your thoughts about getting involved in any adult ministry. The adult ministry team wants and needs to hear from each of you. Maybe you're interested in serving on our adult ministry planning team. Our team is heavy on senior citizens with, you know, gray hair. We need the balance of younger adults. In two Sundays on November 7th, right after church, we'll be holding a time of exploration and dreaming about a new direction for our adult ministry. If you are interested in sharing your input, let me or Dr. Busick know, or just come. Share with us your needs and your desires for ministry to adults of all ages. You can pick up a lunch in the fellowship hall and jo join us in the conference room. Sunday, November 7th, noon, adult ministry exploration. Help us help you to help God's kingdom at Emmanuel Baptist. Thanks. Grateful to uh, Judy for stepping up. I remember years ago when we were 
first talking about adult ministry, you weren't, sh you weren't sure you were going to do this. And I thought that you weren't until you came back and said you're praying about it. And maybe this is where God wanted you and he has uh, used you in a good way. Thank you. Uh, as we uh, come to our offering, um, a few things. One is uh, uh, we're blessed to have Destiny Duncan with us. Uh, she came home from Kenya to be um, physically present and provide support for her good friend, Melissa Elam. The service this week was a real celebration of his life, and I know it meant the world to uh, uh, Melissa to have, have you here. But this was an unexpected trip, and I, I just told her that the church would, uh, the church would foot the bill for the, for the plane fare. Uh, so uh, we're going to do that either way, but if you, if you want to uh, contribute toward that, you can, and just, just mention uh, Mission Trip Duncan or whatever, just to make sure we know. Um, some people have given us money to send Fred back to Africa. Um, I, I'm going to have to return that because as far as I know, he doesn't want to go uh, at this point. So uh, <laughs> you're ready. He's ready. He, he has his tribal uniform. Uh, we are, uh, after uh, quite a few years of uh, the capital team meeting, we are finally to the point where we're beginning to show you um, some architectural pictures of, 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 of where we are. Um, this sanctuary is as it was back uh, in 1970. All the, the carpet, pews, everything is, is as it was when, when we first uh, brought it together. And so there was some discussion about opening up the front a little bit so that uh, if we ever have special music or whatever, you can kind of see. Also, we wanted to move uh, the front out about three, three to four feet. And uh, we wanted to buy some professional choir risers that are in sections that uh, we could use as is or, or, or uh, change them as needed. So here are two pictures um, that I've been sending out on my uh, weekly uh, email. That's a, an overview where you can kind of look down. You can see where the, the front is open and the front steps uh, kind of go out and forward. Um, there's going to be uh, two portable side. We have a lectern and a pulpit now. What we'll have in the future will be two side pulpits that are wired, and they can be brought out as, as needed for special um, programs where we have readers or, or special music. But if they're not being used, they'll be off to, the, off to the side. But we feel like that kind of opens it up. Um, you'll notice that the, uh, the, the center aisle is uh, solid pews. We wanted to kind of keep the uh, kind of uniformity of pews all the way back. And then there's cut-ins about halfway back for... Uh, for chairs, or those can be pulled out if we have a wheelchair. And there's also a cutout on the last row where if someone is in a wheelchair and wants to kind of roll in, they, they'd be able to do that. Uh, the pews have memory foam and lumbar supports, which to me is a problem because they're like really comfortable and uh, feel like many of you may be getting some more rest with, in, in this time of service, but I think you'll like it. Uh, and then here's a, just a center shot of... Uh, um, and. Uh, the uh, dominant reaction here is that's a lot of blue, and it seems to be a little too light. Uh, the actual the actual carpet color that we're looking at is a dark um, is a darker blue, not uh, not that light. Uh, and then the uh, the pews have a kind of a blue with a uh, s little s little specks of uh, silver uh, in them. Uh, but this is this is how we have envisioned it, and we're uh, rolling it out uh, last week, this week, and then next week also Sunday morning, and then uh, Sunday night, October 31st, is an open forum, six o'clock. You can come in person, and uh, we'll we'll have the capital team here to answer your questions and lay things out, and also you can zoom in, um, and and then we're taking November and December just to pray over it. Uh, we this is this is a proposal. Nothing nothing said about this. Uh, it's how we've envisioned it. We think it could be helpful for the church. We imagine uh, it is a way of paying it forward, new carpet, new pews, new lights. Uh, we've already done a, almost a complete rehaul in audio, audio visual, camera, computer, things that uh, we've done a number of things in, in advance. And there's a few other capital items that are around the edges, but this is kind of the main, the main thing. So anyway, uh, we're just bringing this to you and ask you to keep praying, and then Sunday night, October 31st, 6 p.m., you can zoom in or you can come in person, and that'll be the first time that we really begin to hash out. Uh, as people call in and say, well, I really like this or I really don't like this, we're keeping notes, we're, 
uh, we'll, we're, we're going to add it up, and then if we need to make adjustments or whatever, or, or if you choose not to do it. There will be a time in January where we're going to vote, and if you vote yes, then we want to know how much you're willing to pay. Uh, we'll roll out an estimated cost uh, probably on the 31st. We'll give people like a, a, a sense of the, what we're planning on spending to do that. Okay, uh, this week, I think a lot of, hopefully a lot of you received a letter from the church that said thank you. Um, Emmanuel ha could, could not be here because you, many people haven't been here in person, but through it all you've given. Because you've given, we're here and we, we're anticipating good things and we're very, very, very thankful. We're going to be blessed now by Krista Rates, who's going to share a song called, for us called Lamb of God. And uh, David will accompany Father, please accept these gifts we give back to you and use them to glorify your kingdom in this place 
this country and around the world. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The scripture today is Jeremiah 31, 30, uh, verses 1 through 9. At that time, declares the Lord, I will be God of all the clans of Israel, and they will be my people. This is what the Lord says. The people who survive the sword will find favor in the desert. I will come to give rest to Israel. The Lord appeared to us in the past saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. I will build you up again and you will be rebuilt, O virgin Israel. Again, you will take up your tambourines and go out to dance with the joyful. Again, you will plant vineyards on the hills of Samaria. The farmers will plant them and enjoy their fruit. There will be a day when the watchmen cry out on the hills of Ephraim. Come, let us go up to Zion, to the Lord our God. This is what the Lord says. Sing with joy for Jacob. Shout for the foremost of the nations. Make your praises heard and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I will bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the ends of the earth. Among them there will be blind and the lame expectant mothers and women in labor. A great thong will return. They will come with weeping. They will pray as I bring them back. I will lead them beside the streams of water on a level path where they will not stumble because I am Israel's father and Ephraim is my firstborn son. Time of uh, praises and uh, prayer. Uh, last week we had Jim Sims from the Latrobe Mission and he gave us a really nice update on what they're doing. And we also raised uh, $600, maybe more, I haven't heard the final count, but at least 600 for the, for the mission. Uh, Blaine Hess has had a wonderful song, as, uh, uh, as also we had today. Uh, Dave Marino, here in the front row, came, came forward to join uh, the church. Um, and by the way, the, uh, there are four pictures of our proposed sanctuary renovation in the hallway. Uh, those are framed, and you can kind of see all, all four of them uh, out there. Um, some pictures that were uh, cluttering my desktop that I just wanted to bring out. There's uh, Dave and... And uh, Nate, they were serving at the Salvation Army, and I don't know when that was, but uh, I just had it in there. Grateful that our youth take the, uh, take, the, take the lead at the Salvation Army meal. We serve every Sunday at 2. Um, and then, uh, oh, Cody, Cody Alfred had a one-year um, one year ramp rate. I don't know what that means other than he hit his uh, goals at this new company uh, sooner than most people do, and they acknowledged him in their publication. So Cody Alfred doing... Uh, doing well. Uh, and then I think there's a series. Yeah, these are just pictures from, that I had from the picnic that uh, you can just go kind of go through those. But you can, uh, you can see that we just had a great time. Uh, I think Kim, Kim Jackson took these pictures. And there's a, wait, who is that? That's Matthew. Matthew uh, getting the, the raindrops. <laughs> you know, we had, we had bottled water, but that wasn't good enough for him. So. <laughs> uh, and then a few others there. Uh, yeah, this was a homeless person that uh, we, we felt sorry for, so uh, we invited him. Actually, he wouldn't leave. He just wouldn't leave. So uh, we uh, we did we did feed him, and uh, uh, we're also gonna we're gonna help him buy a new tent so he can stay at stay at the city park here. Uh, here's uh, Lyndall and Judy. Lyndall always makes the incredible chicken that draws everybody out, and it was again another another great year on that front. Um, Here's uh, Lynn with uh, Carly. Uh, it just all these things happening around at the picnic. It just made it a made it a fun time. Uh, uh, this, is, <laughs> this is my dad uh, when I was home, uh, 94 years old. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to show you this. <laughs> this is what a 94 year old man does around his yard, and. Uh, I just hope that when you're 94 that you'll use a chainsaw too. Uh, there's, 
Nothing scarier than your dad. And by the way, he has three chainsaws, all of which uh, work beautifully, and he just goes through the yard cutting things like that. So, uh, Anyway, actually, that, th- this would be a time to pray. This would be a time for us to pray for, for uh, older men with chainsaws. <laughs> uh, Mona's, uh, Mona's father, uh, uh, Wadi Abdo, has had some health issues with heart and some pneumonia, but uh, the latest update was that he's doing a little bit better, so we're grateful for that. Sam Bolian uh, was in the hospital briefly, but back at Wingate and doing some better. Um, we're, we praise God that destiny is with us, and we're also going to pray as you head out, head back, and you're going to head back, and then you're coming back in December. So we're, we're anxious to see you. Uh, Duncan, um, um, Brent, uh, Brent will bring the message on the first Sunday in, in, in December, and they'll update us on their ministry. Uh, Jenny Altmiller's mom, Virginia Lorick, passed in Atlanta. The service was last week. Um, Rhonda Johnson's father, uh, John Kinnamuth, uh, was out of the hospital um, had COVID in the hospital, out, and now he had to go back in. Rhonda said, please pray. Pam McLean will have cornea surgery tomorrow, and she's asking for prayer for that. Um, Rich Shaver has back surgery coming up November 2nd, and we're praying that that goes well. And then uh, Billy Reed, 18-year-old, uh, just graduated from PHS. He, he finally uh, passed, and um, he, um, interesting, he was an a organ donor, and so his, uh, his corneas are going to go to to uh, support uh, some other uh, people, and there, there's a, I'll, I'll print up his, uh, his obituary. He, he had, a, had, a good, had a good life and it inspired a lot of people. Terry Fielder's friend, uh, Terry Wheel, um, died of COVID this week at Camden Clark, and she asked for prayer for, for Terry and also for the uh, nine, nine-year-old great niece that she was raising. Um, and then Jean Farley Nordick's uh, older sister in Arizona passed away, Sondra Simpson, and then uh, Jeff Beatty's father, Gene, passed away uh, this, this week. So a number of folks uh, who, have, who have passed that we want to, want to remember. Um, any, other, um, any other corrections or additions? Our theme is love, and there's a, a beautiful old uh, gospel song called Love Lifted Me. Let's uh, share a verse of that as we go to prayer. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love could help. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Father, we thank you for this time because we can all remember times when we've been down, when we've um, been struggling when we've lost all self-worth and any sense that we even want to go on. And a lot of times, Father, that's been the result of relationships, friends that have moved away or betrayed us or uh, within a marriage where we have um, navigated uh, the, the, uh, the end of a, of a marriage that has uh, led, us to, uh, led us to maybe a dark time. And we are thankful that your love especially meets us in the dark valleys. And I love what it says in Psalm 23, that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for you are with me. Thank you, Father, for being with us in those dark, difficult times. You are love, and because of you, we're able to love others. You're also light, and you bring light into our darkness. We can't see. We don't know where to go. We don't have wisdom. We're not sure if we're on the right path, if we should go forward or go back. And you light the way. You show us where to go. If we're humble enough, you will, you'll, you'll show us. Sometimes it may be counterintuitive to what we think. We may have a particular view of what we need to do, and then you light us down a path that we weren't expecting. 
And yet, if we're honest, we feel in our spirit that, that you are moving, you're speaking to us. So, Father, all we ask in this time is that you would open up our minds and our spirits so that we would hear from you. Our goal is not to do our own will, but to do your will. And that, that involves everything we do with our finances, with our time, and in our relationships. We pray that we would love with your love and that you would show us things that we need to do. Father, we especially pray for those that grieve the loss of loved ones, that you would be close to them and that you would give them peace. And Father, after the funeral's over, a lot of us, we just kind of move on with our lives. But the people who have lost loved ones, really the difficult days are the weeks, months, and even years after the loss. So help us not to forget. Uh, help us to remember anniversaries and things of, that uh, would be important to the person who lost the loved one. Thank you for Grief Share and Gail who facilitates it. Father, thank you for Divorce Care and Melanie who facilitates it. it those are ministries that come alongside people at, at difficult times and gives them hope. Father, as we continue through the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus' words, uh, sometimes they're hard to hear. Help us by your spirit to... to uh, Look at your word uh, openly and to learn and grow. We pray all this and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Divorce is uh, complicated, difficult, um, painful. Uh, it's uh, emotional. So um, because it's all of those things, I thought maybe I'd give you a smile before we, <laughs> before we wade into this. Uh, this someone, sent me, someone sent this to me this week. Um, Ed was in trouble. He forgot his wedding anniversary, and his wife was angry. She told him, tomorrow morning, I expect to find a gift in the driveway that goes zero to 206 seconds, and it better be there. Next morning, Ed got up and left for work, and when his wife woke up, she looked out the window, and sure enough, small gift wrap box in the middle of the driveway. Confused, the wife put on a robe, ran out to the driveway, brought the box into the house, and she opened it to find a brand new bathroom scale. Funeral services for Ed have been scheduled for Friday. <laughs> These are the things that lead to divorce and to death. Uh, and this, an actual Craigslist ad from a frustrated wife in Logan, Utah. I'm selling my 22-year-old husband. Uh, he enjoys eating and playing video games all day. Easy to maintain, just feed and water, feed and water every three hours. Uh, you must have a good internet connection and space for gaming. I got tired of waiting, so free to a good home. Uh, if acceptable, replacement is offered, we'll trade. Yes. Um, just a smile before we wade into a, uh, a, a topic that is uh, challenging, and that is Jesus talks about marriage. He also talks very, uh, very directly about divorce, and I'll just read you. Um, last week, he, uh, he said that, um, you know, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery, but I say that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has committed uh, adultery in his, in his heart. Um, and uh, he, he moves on in Matthew 5, uh, verse 31, to say this. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness causes her to become an adulteress, and anyone who marries the divorced woman commits uh, adultery. So there's just no way to make this easy. Uh, divorce is, by definition, difficult. It's complicated. It's painful. It's a, an emotional issue that I would, uh, I would suggest it, it, it probably affects, it, it affects every single one of us in this room, either directly or indirectly. You've got family or, or, or friends that, uh, that, have gone, that have gone through this. It occurs to me that the, thing, the emotions you feel upon a divorce are the same emotions you feel at a death. And uh, Kubler-Ross had the, had the classic uh, stages of grief uh, at death, and it begins with denial, moves to despair, then comes anger, then there's bargaining, then you, then you bottom out into depression, and finally you come to a place where you kind of accept what has happened after so many things have, uh, have gone on. So the thing about death, is, the thing about divorce is there's a death of a relationship, but there's not a funeral that brings closure. I mean, you lose a, you lose a loved one, as devastating as that is, uh, you're able to go to the funeral home, say, say what you need to say, and then a lot of times there, 
a lot of cremation now. You, you've got ashes, or you, or you go, and there's a graveside, and, and there's even it, the, the implications carry on for months, years, and for the rest of your life, but there's some closure. Um, divorce is divorce is like zombie land. It's the, uh, the walking dead for many people. Uh, you're walking around, and there's a, there's a dead feeling in, 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 your, in your heart. Uh, you, can, you can move on, and your life goes on, but you, you'll, always, you'll always deal with that. This week in my uh, email, I sent out a poem called The Wall, and it basically said that two couples got to the point where they weren't able to engage each other in a meaningful way, and this wall keeps rising up. And it says, at the end, uh, marriages don't end in a, in a fiery uh, clash, but, at the, but two people exhausted at the bottom of a wall that they could not scale. And some of you have been there. Some of you have sat at the bottom of that wall that you wanted to try to, you wanted to, try to look over. You wanted to try to engage, but it seemed like the wall kept getting taller and your, and your energy kept getting less. And so uh, divorce is just a reality in our lives and in the lives of our country. America uh, has the highest divorce rate. We're the third highest in the world uh, behind Maldives. I don't even know where that is. And Belarus, I'm not sure where that is either. <laughs> then comes the U.S. So of any industrialized uh, nation, we, we divorce more than, more than anyone else. Americans have come to accept divorce as natural, inevitable. Um, we even applaud people who end their marriages. Uh, Hallmark has a card line that, uh, for divorce car, for people divorcing. One said, uh, getting a divorce can be very healthy. Watch how it improves your circulation. Um, and one person said, our society accepts divorce and almost, almost expects it. Um, more people congratulated me on my divorce than, than congratulated me on my marriage. So um, it's become a reality, and I know it's a reality for many of you, and after the first service, I realized that I weighed into this, and I'm sharing this, and I realized for many of you, this is personal, this is real, this is hurtful. There's no way even to talk about it without bringing back some of the, some of the emotions that you have felt or are feeling. So, but Jesus goes right at it, and I think we have to, too. Let me give you the context. Uh, Matthew 5, 1 to 30, we get the, the verses prior to what Jesus said on, on uh, divorce. And he, he gives us um, qualities that enhance marriage and also sinful attitudes that can lead to divorce. And so in the verses that lead up to this, Jesus called us to humility, to kindness, to purity, and to peacemaking. He calls us to be light in the darkness and calls us to be the salt of the world, preserving what's, what's good. And th- but he also says, don't be, co- don't be overcome with anger and bitterness. Don't speak in hurtful ways. Don't let lustful fantasies that lead to adultery become part of your life. Don't linger with people or places where you know you'll be tempted. And so Jesus is saying, remember that marriage is sacred. It is permanent. Uh, it's a commitment, and it doesn't just go away because you walk away from it, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, I wanted to give you a, last week I, I gave you uh, the image of the paper plate, and that lust is kind of a paper plate mentality. It's, uh, it's cheap, you use it, dispose of it. The problem with lust is it leaves us kind of torn, and... Um, uh, not, not in a good place, whereas uh, love ultimately is, a, is like fine china. It enhances everything that's on it, and you don't throw this away. You clean it and you cherish it. Um, so two different, two different approaches. The world kind of has a kind of a hookup, lust, get together, enjoy the person, walk away. doesn't really matter. didn't mean anything to you. doesn't mean anything to me. We know that's a lie. This, the, the paper plate, the, throw, the throwaway culture leaves, leaves us devastated. This is what we were made for. This is what God said intimacy ought to be. We know it's true, and yet sometimes we just want to go with what the culture says because it's easier. So as we think about uh, marriage and divorce, I, it occurred to me that for years, the, uh, the dominant symbol in marriage was the two candles, and typically the, the bride's family and the groom's family would each light an individual candle at the start of the service, and then near the end of the service, the bride and the groom would combine those two candles into one. Candle ceremony, the two become one. More recently, the more common uh, visual for a marriage has, it's moved to sand, because with sand, you have something you can take home and and see. And so you have have the the man, uh, and usually you have the the bride 
the groom, and a lot of times there's children already, so the children have their sand too, and you're all around. But let, we'll have the bride, he pours, the groom, uh, the blue, he pours his in. Um, like so. And then the bride has hers, and we'll pink just to kind of give you kind of the gender cue there. Uh, and then... And then the white would be God, who kind of oversees the whole process. And so there, there you have it. You can, if you look at it, it's kind of cool. You can see there, there's the man, there's the woman, and there's God who, who oversees all of it. Usually they're, they're kind of mixed in differently because you're pouring at the same time. So this is what we end the marriage with. This is what you take home. This is what you put on the mantle. It's a symbol of, of that time when you said, yes, I do, it's going to work. And then it doesn't work. And what, it, what happens is... Uh, the marriage just simply gets poured out. And uh, just as publicly as you gathered to uh, pour the sand into the container, um, it gets poured out. Um, it gets poured out, and everyone can see it. And what makes, uh, you know, what makes uh, divorce so difficult? This is neat. Publicly, you have, you have declared your commitment. People saw it and prayed for you. This is a mess. And it's right out there in front of everybody to see. You can't clean it. You can't clean it up. It is. It is what it is. And everybody weighs in on it. And everybody's saying, "Well, she was at fault. He was at fault. Whatever." But there it is. It's. It's the mess that you've got to live with. And I'll leave it there till till the end. And we'll come. We'll come back to it. Um, there's a cultural context for uh, Jesus's words, uh, and it's the first century Jewish Roman world where women had no rights and no recourse. Um, in Matthew 19, it says the Pharisees uh, were trying to test Jesus, and they wanted him to go on record in the running divorce debate. So in Matthew 19, 3, they said, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? And they were referring to a passage in Deuteronomy 4 where Moses gave Israel some reasons why a man could divorce his wife. He could divorce his wife if she became displeasing or if there was something indecent. And so two schools of rabbinic thought worked with Deuteronomy 24. The school of Shammai uh, came out and said that the only reason for divorce should be something very serious, like, like infidelity or adultery. The school of Hillel came out, and they said you could divorce your wife for any reason, if they were a bad cook, if they spoke to another man, if they were combative, emotional, or quarrelsome, if the man just finds his wife to be less attractive. All he had to do was look at her, Write a certificate saying, I'm done with you. you. You give it to her, and she's done. She's out the door. That's it. No recourse, no rights. And the school of Hillel was very popular because if a man simply became disenchanted or saw a younger, more attractive model at the market, you could literally do this horse trading thing where one man says, hey, your wife looks attractive to me. The guy would say, hey, you can have her. Uh, your wife looks good to me. Uh, let's, let's, let's swap, shall we? And you think I'm exaggerating, but that is what literally, historically, was going on, it, both in the Jewish culture, in, in the Roman culture, uh, the Greek or Roman culture, the, they had uh, wives for legal children and then mistresses for their, for their pleasure, and that was just simply understood. And so Jesus weighs into this, and essentially he's saying, you can't just, you can't just throw out someone that you committed to, you're, you're married to them in the eyes of God. You've become one in the eyes of God. And so you can't casually or flippantly, because you've decided, because you've changed your mind, just send them away. So do you see what Jesus is doing? When he says that you commit adultery when you send them away, and you commit adultery when you marry that person, he's addressing this kind of a good old boy system where the guy said, you know what, hey, we can, we, we can have fun with this. And Jesus said marriage was never meant to be like that. He, he makes the point that marriage should be a last result. A divorce should be a last resort for a serious reason. You should never, marriage should never end in a casual way for selfish reasons. And that, it, it's important to see the context of this because a lot of people have just kind of taken it at face value. And if you're divorced, you're done. You know, you can't marry again. But no, Jesus was dealing with a very specific situation where people were in, in sin against God's design for marriage, and he's addressing, he's addressing that situation. Well, divorce is, is not a new issue. Uh, the prophet uh, Malachi 
says uh, God hates, God hates divorce, says it right there. And then Malachi 2 says marriage reminds us of God's covenant of love, that just as God is, shows covenant love to us, we're to show that covenant love within our marriages. And Malachi goes on to say that when, you're unfaithful to, when we're unfaithful to a spouse, it carries over to our spiritual lives. If someone, uh, and it's true, that when someone gives up on a marriage, a lot of times they move out of any kind of a faith uh, experience. And sometimes it's just awkward social dynamics. You, maybe you were going as a couple to a church, and then it becomes awkward. Uh, it, I can't go to that church anymore. People have watched us deteriorate in front of their eyes. And so there's just a lot of people who don't end up going to church at all, and then they just kind of fade away. So Malachi said, you can give up on your marriage, and you can kind of watch yourself because it can lead you to give up on God altogether, which we need to think about this as a as a family of faith, as we think about our own divorces, how did people, did people leave us alone? Did, did anyone call us? Did anyone encourage us during that time? Um, and if we know someone that, that has fallen out around divorce, did we treat them like lepers or did we pursue them? Did we tell them, I'm praying for you, I'm there for you, uh, I, I love you? Well, in Matthew 19, the Pharisees want to debate divorce, but Jesus wants to celebrate marriage. The Pharisees want to debate divorce. They come, they come to Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, there's this, there's this uh, divorce debate going on. School of Shammai says it needs to be serious. School of Hillel says you can, you can get divorced for any reason. So where do you come down on it? And what does Jesus do? And this is, this is crucial. Jesus does not debate divorce. Jesus says, let's go back to creation. Let's go back to what God designed from the beginning. And he, and he quotes Genesis 2 at the beginning, God made them male and female, and a man will leave his parents, be united to his wife, and the two will become one. So they are no longer two, but one. What God has joined together, let man not separate. So what does Jesus say? He says, you know, I know that, that Moses gave these rules for divorce as a concession to your hardness, the hardness of your heart, but let me tell you what it was meant from what was meant from the beginning. And by the way, Jesus was the one through whom everything was created. Jesus created marriage. Jesus defines marriage, and Jesus defines gender. And Jesus calls everyone to lift up marriage as a sacred place where two sinful people are joined together in love and given the responsibility of raising children. In our time, when we are confused about marriage, when we're confused about gender. You know, to me, people, I follow Jesus, and I follow the words that he's given me. And does Jesus speak into our confusing times? <laughs> yes. He said, there is a creational reality to marriage. I made it, and this is how it works. Okay. People, you can go off in any direction you want, but when Jesus says something, you better take it seriously. And to me, as I said in my weekly email, marriage is like gravity. It is what it is. You know, you can be talking to somebody on a third floor of a building, and someone will look at you and say, you know what, I don't believe in gravity. In fact, and he pulls you off of the balcony of the third floor, and on the way down, he said, you know, these people who are all hung up over gravity, well, I don't believe in it. Okay, that's before, that's right before they hit. Because gravity's not listening to the arguments against it, it just is. And my theory, as I've come to believe, is that marriage just is. It's how God made it, and if you kind of follow along with his design, things go well for you, which by the way, all you have to do is look at every scientific social study that has been done, and people that are in a two-parent home of people that are committed, and children that are in that home, do amazingly well. No comparison to any other family form. What God designed works, and it just is, okay? i I make that point, but people, there's also another reality, and that is a lot of people in my world and your world have another reality in their life, and they don't follow, they don't follow this. And so knowing what I know, that marriage just is what it is, I don't need to argue about it, okay? If you live according to it, it's going to go well for you. If you don't, I've seen it over and over, it doesn't go well for you. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to sit around and judge people who are in a gay or a lesbian relationship who are having to show love and support and compassion to one another and who are raising kids. 
It's not, it's not God's ideal, but we all fall short of God's ideal. And so what I have found that I do in situations where people are outside of what I believe is God's ultimate ideal is I, I listen and uh, I, I love and I show grace. And if people uh, want to know, <laughs> if people want to know what I think, uh, I'll, I'll tell them. Uh, but I've found that there, people are not going to make any changes in their life or in their family structure unless the Spirit of God speaks to them. And they're probably not going to think about the Spirit if there's a bunch of Christians coming around saying, you know what, your, your sinner's going to hell. I don't think that's going to get him anywhere. A few years ago, someone uh, left this church, and they, as they left, uh, I had preached on family. And I remember the, the phrase he told me as he was leaving my office. He said, I need you to say that gays are going to hell. He said, I need you to preach that. And I said, well, I said, okay. I said, I'll do that. But uh, last I checked, gossipers are going to hell, <laughs> as well as adulterers. Uh, you got that figured out? You, you live in that fully? And so the church, I think, has to, we've got to deal with our struggles. We have to let God do a work in our families, in our lives. And I think for others, we come alongside, and I think we need to lead, I think we need to lead with love. Uh, that's, my, that's my take. Marriage is like gravity. It is what it is. And if you live according to it, things, things go well. Well, you can make a biblical case for divorce in the following areas. If there is uh, adultery, abandonment, or abuse. If there, is, uh, if there is adultery, someone simply moves out of the relationship and they have found someone else, and they're really... They're, they seem to be taken by that other relationship. That's untenable. It does not, you can't, you, you can, I know people that have hung in over time in those situations, just praying and praying and praying that the person's coming back. But there comes a point where you say, no, I'm not, I'm not living like this anymore. And, and Jesus even says that, that is a, uh, that's the reason. Now, if that person is repentant and wants to come back and you think that their repentance is genuine, I, there have been times I've said, let's, let's pray over this. They, 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 they're showing some signs of maybe wanting to, but that has to be shown real over time. And then there's abandonment where someone just abandons you. Um, and that can be because of addiction. Someone's so addicted to something like drugs or pornography or gambling or work that they simply abandon you and they're not there. They're not there for you. Over time, I believe that's a, a, a cause for divorce. And then there's, then there's abuse. It can be uh, physical, verbal, uh, emotional uh, some of you have been in abusive relationships, and I know, I literally know some ministers, some Baptist ministers who have counseled women to remain in abusive situations because they're going to pray their husband into the kingdom. And I think that's ridiculous. If you're being verbally abused, if you're being physically abused, if you're being sexually abused, God never meant for you to stay in that. Uh, you separate, and then... Uh, if divorce then follows, it follows. If God, if God calls you back together, then good. But you're not meant to stay uh, in an abusive situation. Uh, a few practical thoughts. In the process of marriage and divorce, I think we can grow, we can grow in love. Um, well, Jesus, they asked Jesus, what's the most important thing in the Bible? And Jesus says, it's love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And I think in every marriage relationship you've been in and left, you've had to learn, because of divorce, you've had to learn how to love. And the, and the learning how to love continues after the divorce, and sometimes it's even harder because you're having to love this person who sometimes lives to put you down or to, to uh, uh, speak badly about you. And they were someone you were connected to, and now you're not. And so God gave us marriage, and even in the process of, of divorce, he gives us an opportunity to learn how to love. And for some reason, I thought about Joseph this week, Joseph and Mary. And you remember, Joseph had all the evidence that, that he should divorce Mary. But what did he do? He, he waited, and he prayed, and he asked God for a miracle. And, and God sent an angel and ultimately, he stayed. He stayed in it. And God, God can work a, a miracle. Joseph showed, showed love. Which, by the way, all of this love that we're learning in marriage and even through divorce, ultimately that gives way to a love for God. Jesus said, in heaven there's no marriage, but we'll be like the angels. Uh, suddenly, this love that we have learned in the crucible of marriage gives way to the ultimate love, which is God. And so in heaven, we're not going to be married. And Mona asked me, so what am I going to be to you in heaven? And I, I said, well, I'll work you in for lunch like every other week. 
You know, I'm, I'm not going to complain. <laughs> oh, God help me. I don't know how we've been married for 40 years, but we have. When it comes to relationships, are you a lawyer or are you a lover? Um, lawyers keep a record of wrongs, and in fact, they highlight the negative things so they can make their case. And a lot of people in marriages, if that's you, you're not going to stay married very long. Because love has the ability to overlook offenses. Love has the ability to forgive. Love has the ability to say, God, not, not my will, but your will be done. I'll even stay in a tough relationship over time to believe that you could do something in it. And so here's, uh, here's one of the dominant things that, that a lot of people have told me or I've sensed in counseling is divorce makes me a failure. And uh, I showed this uh, I showed this clip in the first service. If you've experienced divorce, you're not a failure. I wanted to show you a brief clip that I remember from an old movie, Kramer versus Kramer. And to me, I, I saw this when I was young, and I never forgot this. And to me, the lawyer in this scene is speaking the words of the devil uh, in, a, in a courtroom setting. So we'll watch this briefly. What was the longest personal relationship in your life uh, outside of your parents or girlfriends? I suppose that would be with my child. Whom you've seen twice in a year. Mrs. Kramer, your ex-husband. Wasn't he the longest personal relationship in your life? Uh, would you speak up, Mrs. Kramer? I couldn't hear you. Yes. How long was that? We were married a year before the baby. And then seven years after that. So, you were a failure at the one most important relationship in your life. Objects. Overruled. The witness's opinion on this is relevant. I was not a failure. Oh? What do you call it then? A success? The marriage ended in divorce. I consider it less my failure than his. Congratulations, Mrs. Kramer. You've just rewritten matrimonial law. You were both divorced. Objection. Your Honor, I would like to ask what this model of civility and respectability has ever succeeded at. Were you a failure at the one most important personal relationship in your life? It did not succeed. Not it, Mrs. Kramer. You. Were you a failure at the one most important relationship in your life? Were you? Is that a yes, Mrs. Kramer? No further questions. Did you have to be so rough on it? Do you want the kid or not? That's hard to watch, and yet it's real. Because a lot of people that I talk to that have been through divorce, Satan comes along and says, you know what? You're a failure. You're a failure at the most important relationship in your life, and you failed. In fact, that defines you. That's who you are. And then we begin to kind of internalize that, and boy, we shouldn't. Because what does God say in Philippians 1.5? He who began, Paul, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day, God, until the day of Christ. God is continuing to work in your life. And I, I would say this uh, as, we, as we close down, is be willing to get involved um, in the lives of people who are going through uh, this. It's so easy for us to look at the mess and to realize, you know what, I don't know, what, I don't know how to speak into it. I don't know what to say. I may say the wrong thing. So it's better maybe if I just don't say anything. And I think us pulling back kind of reinforces the fact that it's a bigger mess than you can deal with. So I, when, we need to be willing to get involved. Did you read this week about the, the uh, assault that happened in a, in a train in Philadelphia, a commuter train? There were people on the, people on the train that watched it. Not one of them called, nine, not one of them called 911. This woman was, was assaulted on, publicly in a train. And I, that's horrible when you think about it. But a lot of us, we watch people going down, and we don't do anything other than to just kind of remain silent. And so last point here is that our God is a God of hope. Uh, and second chances and new beginnings. It says the Lord is close to the brokenhearted 
and he receives those who are crushed in spirit. Satan may say, you're a failure, but God says, you're a child of God, and I have work for you to do. You learn things in that relationship. You're a different person. You've developed character, and I'm going to continue to use you. You're a deeper, richer, fuller person. Even having that thing in your life that you think maybe defines you, that doesn't define you. I do. My spirit defines you. So what are we supposed to do with this mess? One of the things that I think we do is we sit down with the person, and we can go through it a little bit, and there's the blue. That's, your, that's the guy you're married to, and there's the... Uh, there's the pen. That's you. You're in there. And you know what I'm saying? There's white. There's, God is literally everywhere in this. And so your friend begins to look, look over this mess and say, you know what? There's, uh, I, see you. I still see you in here, and, and the other person's in here too, but we're, I know you're struggling. But God is all through this. And then what we do, what I imagine we do, is we pick up the mess and lovingly, we talk to them, we pray for them, and we take that container that it was originally in and we just pour it back into that, that vessel of commitment that seems like it was going to be empty forever. And you know what? Actually, it's beautiful, isn't it? The person's still in there. The other person's still in there, but God is everywhere. And we help people who maybe have forgotten that to see it. Let's, let's pray. Father, thank you. Our hope uh, for our lives and our relationship is that you would come into our hearts and where we feel that we have failed a hundred times. And Satan comes along like that lawyer and says, you are a failure in the most important relationship in your life. Well, Father, we're all failures. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but praise be to you that you use failures. You transform us into new creations in Christ, and there is hope. There's new beginnings. There's second chances, all because of our Lord. Help us to look to him and love him more each day, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing together, O love that will not let me go. And we're a little over time, but we're going to go ahead and sing three verses because they're all good. And uh, if you desire to come forward to uh, receive Christ or to join our church, please do as we close. of a minister is to be with uh, someone in the hospital room where um, a loved one has passed. And so this week, uh, 
as soon as I heard that uh, Jeff's uh, father, uh, Gene, had passed, I was able to be down and we, down to the room, and we, uh, we were there while they were making arrangements, and we were talking about your father and all he meant to you, and, um, um, but something happened as you were, uh, as you were headed uh, home. It was, uh, it was rainy, and then the sun came out. <laughs> you have to get mad to find out this is Rainbow Kiss. I said, God, I want a rainbow. <laughs> so I got home for just enough of a rainbow <laughs> he sent me. He sent me a picture on my phone, and it wasn't a full one, but all, right off to the side was this uh, rainbow after the, after the rain, and I, it was a sign uh, to Jeff that his father had passed. But uh, we're a God, that, that we worship a God who gives us hope, even, even in the midst of death. So uh, let's, uh, let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, thank you for Jeff and his uh, ministry here at Emmanuel. He's been someone who's encouraged us to listen to your spirit and to pray. And Father, talking with Jeff uh, over his father's body, I'm reminded of the impact that a father has on his son, their life, their hard work. Um, if you're going to do things, uh, do it well and uh, be a person of your word. If you say it, do it. These are the qualities that Gene passed on to Jeff, and he's passed on to his children. So we ask you, we ask you that, the, that we would continue to learn each day and that we would love, that we would love in Jesus' name. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.